Welcome back. Now we answer questions we've received from you, our viewers. If you have a question, visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com. Dr. Shabir, this is a bit of a long question, but very good one. It says, since my reversion to Islam, I have been bombarded with, do this, it is Sunnah, or this is the Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is all well, well and good. Following the Prophet is the right way to conduct one's life as a Muslim. The problem is that this often seems to have gone beyond respect, but instead has become a form of worship. An analogy is someone who idolizes a basketball star and wants to emulate that person in all they do. This goes beyond respect and enters the area of worship. I submit that in my experience, there are many Muslims doing the same thing in blindly emulating the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, blindly. How would you respond to this claim, Dr. Shibir? Okay, uh, first of all, I would say that um, you know, Muslims have to be careful in, in dealing with those who are entering our community uh, as, as uh, let me say, converts to the faith or reverts. People say reverts because they, they, they mean by this that the original situation of every child is that that per child is in the natural state, that is the state of Islam, uh, but they didn't know that they were Muslims and later on they embraced the religion, so they're coming back, they're reverting to the original position, which mm -hmm. to us is, is Islam, which means submission to God, not necessarily the name of a religion. Um, uh, or we can say the person has converted to the, to the faith, the person has embraced the religion of Islam. When a person comes into the community like this, uh, we should distinguish between our own comfort level and that person's comfort level. So our own comfort level is what we've lived with, uh, you know, in Muslim societies throughout our lives. You know, we've been there and done that. It's natural for us. We're breathing it. Uh, but for the new person, like everything is going to come as a surprise. So don't put too many surprises. Distinguish between what's necessary and what is on the periphery. So certain things are core. You want to um, instruct the new Muslims like to pray and to fast and to give charity and perform the Hajj if they're able and so on. These are the core items. But uh, things which are on the periphery, periphery, you should not insist on too much, even though we're accustomed to those things. So that means we have to do a little bit of homework as well to make this distinction because in a traditional Muslim context, we may not have made that distinction. Everything to us came as a package and we did everything and it's either you did it all or, or not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for if, when we're instructing you Muslims, we have to uh, go gently and, and show them like the basics and the, and the add-ons. Mm -hmm. So they do the basics first. When they're comfortable with that, they can add other things on. So that's but I not... think this question is right that we kind of get mixed up in our own minds about what is the add-on and what is essential, right? Yes. In terms of following the Prophet Muhammad. So for example, do we have to follow the way he slept or the way he... He ate, you know, the manner, what, how he ate with his hands. Do we have to do that as well? The way he dressed, he wore a long gown. Do we have to do that? You know, he, he I don't know, he rode a camel, for example. Um, he, he used certain medicines that were applicable in his time and that were the best in his time. Do we have to follow and use those medicines today to fight the kinds of um, diseases that we have today? So all those sorts of things, right? So at what level does it become, we are, you know, we love the Prophet Muhammad and we're going to do everything mm -hmm. um, to follow him. And then does it become a sort of, as this person is mentioning, shirk? Like, are we worshipping him? Right? <laughs> okay. So if you don't mind, I want to address this question of shirk or, or idolatry uh, first. And mm -hmm. then we come back to all of these details. Okay. When, like, when do we stop following? Mm -hmm. How do we know what to follow and not, not to follow? So let's say theoretically somebody is assiduously following the Prophet, peace be upon him, in all of these details. Um, uh, to the extent that we read in Islamic history that there is a certain companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who, um, you know, ducked at a certain point, like he lowered his body. And his friends asked him, like, why are you lowering your body at this particular place? And he said, uh, there used to be a tree here uh, with an o overhanging limb. And when the Prophet, peace be upon him, came here, he went, you know, he, he lowered his body to get under this limb. And, uh, and I'm just doing this, the same. So. Now, of course, this may seem odd to everybody else, and probably only one in a you know, hundred thousand people will do this. Most Muslims are not going to do this, and most Muslims would consider it absurd to be following the Prophet, peace be upon him, to this extent. I don't even know if the story is, is true, but, but I've heard it, and, and this is, uh, you know, but it illustrates, true or not, the story illustrates uh, an idea that somebody could be following the Prophet, peace be upon him, to that extent. The Prophet is no longer here, the tree is no longer here, but I'm doing what the Prophet, peace be upon him, did at this particular point. Now, that reflects a certain level of devotion that in Islamic tradition is admirable. And, and no, in Islamic tradition, this is not considered to be shirk or idolatry. 
because it's very clear to us that we're not worshiping the Prophet, peace be upon him, and we're not going to worship the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, he is the, uh, the messenger of God, and he is a servant and messenger of God. There is only one God, the unseen creator of the heavens and the earth. What would be idolatry is, you know, making an image of him and garland it, garlanding it, uh, and, and, or, you know, bowing, showing respect, and, and so on, to a certain uh, degree. It will cross the line. Um, but following his actions, this is thought to be our way of submitting to God as he submitted to God in his whole life with uh, the sum total of all of his actions. Now, I've already said that this person ducking under the non-existing limb is obviously uh, doing something unnecessary in the Islamic faith, right? But it's admirable if one person does it. Maybe we can talk about it as a story and hold it up as an example of somebody who has followed the Prophet, peace be upon him, assiduously, in contrast with the rest of us who tend to not follow the Prophet as much as we probably should have, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, uh, where do we draw the line, though, in general? So in general, we can distinguish between the things that the Prophet, peace be upon him, clearly instructed. Like sometimes he made a distinction. He, he said, you know, I'm, I'm only doing this uh, because I like it. It's not something that I want people to follow. Like, for example, it is mentioned that uh, a lizard was brought at the dinner table and the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, uh, didn't eat, but his, some of his companions were eating. And he made it clear, I'm just avoiding this because, uh, you know, of my own cultural upbringing, uh, I'm not accustomed to this. Mm -hmm. So he made it clear then that I'm not eating it, not because it's forbidden. You don't have to follow me in this. And there was his companion, according to the report, uh, if I remember correctly, Khalid bin Walid, was eating it to his heart's content. <laughs> um, so, so some things the Prophet, peace be upon him, did by, because of his personal uh, acculturation or where he lived, the time and place and so on, uh, those do not necessarily have to be uh, followed. But we can't always tell, right? Because uh, the hadith are just snippets. A lot of times the Prophet doesn't make that sort of disclaimer. Yes, and, and uh, we have to make that sort of decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and sometimes we will, um, you know, err, but uh, we, we, we have to make that distinction. Otherwise, we will burden people with too much. Uh, without making the distinction. And this is what has happened, and this is what the, uh, the revert is asking about, because uh, in some traditional contexts, people have just simply bundled them all together and said, this is what the Prophet did, so just do it, this is Sunnah. So uh, classical Muslim scholars, however, have distinguished between what are called Sunnah Mu'akkada, means emphasized Sunnah, and Sunnah Ghair Mu'akkada, Sunnah that is not emphasized. Sunnah, it is a basic practice, uh, but some are emphasized, some are not emphasized. So um, even the emphasized one is still under the category of sunnah, and sunnah by definition is not fard. If it was fard, it would be called fard, it wouldn't be called a sunnah. Fard means obligatory. Mm -hmm. So some things are obligatory in the Islamic faith, some things are sunnah. It doesn't mean that they are, um, um, they're, they're unimportant, it means that it's not to the level of fard. And it would be wrong for us to, to make it look like it's at the level of fard. Mm -hmm. So the, the earliest Muslims uh, uh, show that they recognize this. Sometimes uh, the, uh, one of the caliphs, like Omar, for example, uh, his example comes to mind. Uh, he recited one of the verses of the Quran uh, at the recitation of which Muslims customarily uh, perform a prostration, the prostrate before God. And he said, I'm deliberately reciting this verse so you, you will see that I'm not prostrating mm -hmm. uh, to illustrate that it's not required. Mm -hmm. You should all know it is not required. So yes, that didn't stop Muslims from prostrating at the recitation of this verse and other verses besides, some 14 or 15 verses of the Quran that have this kind of quality about it, about them. Uh, it doesn't stop Muslims from following this sunnah or this practice that's been recorded of Muslim communities uh, from time immemorial. Uh, but at the same time, it registers as a matter of record uh, that this is not a requirement. So we, we, we would not need to burden some new Muslim with this right away. Maybe eventually the new Muslim finds that Muslims are doing this and the new Muslim wants to do that as well. Uh, but we shouldn't pile them, you know, all of this on all at once. And, and definitely we should make a distinction where this becomes necessary. There are some, some things which the Prophet, peace be upon him, did and uh, to do them in our present times would be really out of place. And, and some people don't recognize that. They, they think we have to do it exactly the way the Prophet, peace be upon him, did it. 
But if he were here today, we have to think about how might he have done things today? Because from everything we know about him, he always did things which were practical, things which were characterized by wisdom in his present circumstance Mm -hmm. and environment. Fit into his circumstance. Exactly. He was known to be a wise man of his time. Even non-Muslims, if they look at him, they would say, this guy is doing some wise things here. They would not agree with his theology. Uh, They wanted to worship their idols and they don't like his, uh, um, his denouncing of their idols. Uh, they, they find it hard to believe that they're going to be resurrected after death. Uh, he's not going to change that. But, but the rest of what he's doing, like practically, they could see that he's doing very practical and wise things. In fact, much of what he did was from the wisdom of the time. And even prior to him, uh, many things were uh, you know, um, taken over from Jewish and Christian communities and continued on as practices within Islam. Uh, many were taken from the environment of the time, not necessarily re- a religious environment, and, and they will continue to be practices within the religion of Islam. And now we know them as Islamic practices because they're connected uh, with the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, but they were just practical and wise things which were done before. You mentioned medicine. So he used the medicine of, of the day, what were known by practical experience to be working. So uh, certain seeds and certain uh, treatments and, uh, you know, honey, for example, uh, which were known for their curative properties. Uh, but that doesn't prevent the study of medicine. And if he were here today, uh, what do we think? Would he be curing cancer uh, by m- modern medical means or would he be curing cancer with black seed and, and honey? And naturally, he would use the modern medical means. And that would be the wise thing to do. So to follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, today uh, would mean to adopt the, the wise and, and uh, practical methods that are available today. That, that really would be the sunnah. So we should think of the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his practice as being uh, more holistic. We should think of it uh, like, for example, if we think about cleaning the teeth. This is uh, emphasized as one of his sunnahs, very much emphasized, cleaning the teeth and cleaning them regularly. But he used the brushing mechanisms which were available at the time. Doesn't prevent us from manufacturing modern toothbrushes, from using uh, modern fluoride and whatever uh, cavity protection uh, toothpastes uh, are available. And if he were here today, that is what he would he would uh, use. But we should think of this more in in terms of oral hygiene. Uh, so it's not just simply brushing the teeth, which is mentioned in the classical Islamic works. But think of it as oral hygiene. This is what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, stressed. And so to follow his sunnah today would would mean to do all of the things that fall under oral hygiene, including uh, using mouthwash, using toothpastes, uh, proper brushes, uh, with soft bristles. Uh, It would mean having regular dental checkups, uh, regular cleaning with your dentist and and so on. Uh, Speaking of which, I'm due for one (laughs) because during the pandemic, I was uh, worried about visiting dentists, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, uh, so, so uh, that when I visit my dentist, I think of myself as following the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, something which is rewardable, think, think this is something that a Muslim ought to do. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Shibir. You're welcome. Support us today and help us share the message of Islam with people across the globe. Thank you and may God bless you and your loved ones with the very best always. <laughs>